Uh, so we are going to change the order of presentation because Rabbi Tom is organizing his stuff. Uh, and, and we all know that his presentations uh, are very special to us. They are very different kinds of presentations. Uh, but first, Camille Watt, Center for Modern Studies University of Nottingham on Labor Market and Segmentation. Hi everyone, so uh, good morning for this uh, first session. I, I would also like to thank the organizers. Uh, it's been a very interesting conference and I've learned a lot in the last two days, so hopefully um, yeah, this is also going to kind of add on to some of the questions we've been kind of asking so far. And uh, so I won't actually look at domestic servants per se, but I want to explore the idea of service itself and especially the concept of Nukri, uh, which is different uh, in the language between Hindi and um, dialects. So it refers to this idea of service, but that goes um, much beyond um, the idea of simply domestic service. And I want to do it with, um, especially with reference to a corpus of four songs and four plays in Bhojpuri, Bhojpuri being um, a dialect of, of Hindi spoken in, uh, in northern India. Uh, and especially so a corpus of texts that have been collected. <laughs> So much of the song will come to like that. So she pleads, she pleads with bad energies for her um, husband not to leave her uh, to go to a distant place uh, for service, Nukri, that's a word that she used. Uh, and what I would like to um, point your attention to here, so on the left you have a transcription of part of this song. And on the right, it's a song that was um, collected by Grayson, a linguist, um, and published in 1884. So I'll just briefly read the lines um, that I've put there. So the Grayson song for the 19th century song goes thus, My lord, in what month will thou return? My beloved has gone away and entered into service, no kami, leaving me alone in the house. He took away for four days, leave, chupi, and came and went away at dawn. And uh, the, the song that I've just played at some point goes, so the refrain is also, Hey, my beloved, take some days leave, some leave, chuti, and stay some more days. You have come home after a long time and you only stay two or four days. Your service, Nokaria, has become my rival, literally um, the second wife. Our material needs, so she said the need of our stomach, uh, are causing much misery. So what is interesting to me here um, is um, what the the question of change and continuities in, uh, in these texts. Because on the one hand, there really are testimonies to the lasting popularity through time and change in um, the media of cultural expression of a specific literary topos, the complaint of the wife uh, left behind as her husband goes away um, to a distant land. On the other hand, one can see shifts in these songs. And just in the, the abstract that I've put up, for instance, the idea of material need, the, the stomach, uh, is actually a new trope which was not there in the previous text uh, of, of the earlier period. So while these songs have a long history, so have the circulatory practices that they refer to. The absent husband is absent because he's away for work, um, to work in a distant place. So what has been studied mostly uh, is from the late 19th century as you have urbanization and industrialization in uh, Eastern India, especially in Bengal and Assam. You will have people from these regions, so in, uh, in red there, which is basically the, um, the eastern regions of UP and the, of Uttar Pradesh and the northern region of Bihar going to work in all kinds of fields. So you have coal mines, um, more in this region, um, the, the one that is in the middle. You have juniors in Calcutta. You have um, then all kinds of urban employment, um, coolies, transportation, even police uh, as well, artisanal activities, shopkeeping, so a lot of different um, type of activities. But this is not a new type of mobility, and this new rural urban uh, mobility starting uh, in the 19th century uh, was rooted in earlier practices of circulation, of merchants and mercenaries, of agricultural labor and artisans, which has long been characteristic of um, this region. So in this paper, I am uh, first to address a methodological question. So looking at a corpus of texts, so these four songs and four plays in Bhojpuri, uh, spanning from the late 19th century to the present, how can one use them as sources? And just briefly, the texts that I will actually be using for this presentation are four songs collected by Gerson, um, which I've already mentioned, in the late 19th century, and then a collection 
of, um, of two folk songs published in the mid 50s, but collected throughout the 30s and 40s by um, Krishna Deng Pabhyay, who was a Brahmin scholar uh, of um, Eastern UP, so he collected basically you know, songs of his own area and villages. Um, then there are chat books, so you have to examine there. Um, Bhojpuri, um, Bhojpuri Saga, and Bideshia. So these are the very cheap kind of booklets that have been published both in UP and Bihar and also in Calcutta um, from the mid 20th century and that you can still find nowadays though um, less and less. So these were collected in the 1990s. <coughs> Then an um, important source for my purpose will be a play by Bikari Thakur. So Bikari Thakur um, is a very famous um, folk playwright, basically, who um, was born in the late 19th century and uh, himself went to Calcutta, worked there for a bit, then came back and um, so perform, composed and performed a number of plays. And Bidishia, so Bidishia literally means the, uh, the foreign, um, the, the husband who has gone away. Uh, and uh, um, so I'll come back, um, come back to this play. It has been performed by itinerant singers and, um, um, and actors throughout the 50s, um, 40s, 50s, 60s. And uh, it was also published in the form of chat books and was also published uh, more recently in a, in a nice uh, edit volume by the Bihar Ashubasha Foundation. And then the recent songs which I've, um, which I've shown you. So in terms of methodology, you know, how do we use these texts? Because they are a literary topos, which means that they are extremely standardized. But on the other hand, while they maintain a certain number of fixed traits, um, each new appropriation of the trope of the hus absent husband has integrated the various new themes, objects, and symbols. Um, so we encounter many traditional figures, and it, which is why it was really interesting for me to also listen to previous talks, because for instance, the Sakhi, the friend, is very much present in these texts. So is the Malini, so the woman ga um, gardener, which we see in Charu's um, talk, as well as you know, this Lord Cat woman who um, seduces the husband. But you also have new figures and objects, so the railways, the rail gari, so the, the train, the money order, the train tickets, all find their way in the boat for symbolical um, repertoire um, from the uh, early 20th century. So, um, Calcutta also, which was not there in the earlier text, becomes a very important location for migration and um, in these songs. But in the more recent um, clips, you have new places. So you have Delhi and Tahrir, where people go to work in coal mines, uh, and also Saudi Arabia in the, in the more recent um, songs. So the plasticity of these topos points to the dual nature of these texts, because they build on a set of inherited and standardized trope, but they also respond to, specific, uh, to the specific historical context of their composition and performance. Um, to, to me, the consistency within these texts of inherited traits and of new and changing elements make them actually an interesting vantage point to uh, study circulatory practices in their diversity and how they change through time. The second methodological question is the fact that this is not the only corpus of text which can be used to study these regions, um, the daily life and practices of its people, including circulation and work. Um, we have administrative and judicial sources, oral histories, Hindi literature, political pamphlets, and so on, much of which we actually have touched on uh, in previous presentation. So um, I will only touch on that in the last section of the paper, but then the question can also be how can we try and bring these together. Thematically, the paper will then specifically focus on the way these texts have dealt with the question of work in a distant place, focusing especially on the concept of nokri as, as it is used there. And especially the question that I want to explore is that of the tension between the way these texts represent circulation and work and the diversity and segmentation of circulatory practices. Because the Bhojpuri migrants that we, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, the, the people that you know, uh, were from the region where these texts were composed and people that were listening to these texts um, and for whom they were um, written or performed, they, they went to Calcutta or to other places to perform very different activities from employment in large scale industries, rickshaw pulling, business, small scale, um, scale artisanal production, or um, employment in the, in the police. And the segmentation of this so called modern labor market built on pre existing differentiation along caste, gender, um, linguistic, and religious line, which raised the question of the way work away from the village was perceived and experienced and represented both on the whole and by different groups. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, questions of status, social mobility, stigmatized work, and the idea of traditional occupation, for instance, all contributed to shape the experience that different people would have made of work away. Uh, but on the other hand, in most songs, the reason for the husband's departure 
um, is usually left unsaid or is referred very elusively. And this is here that the term of nokri becomes extremely important for my purpose. So this is basically what I would like to uh, look into now. Um, so, why the absence of the husband is the prerequisite for the development of the song's lyrical theme, the reason which takes him away are often left unsaid. But in the songs that are a bit more specific, you have three different figures. Um, the husband can appear as a yogi, so someone who goes um, away for um, retire in the, in the forest, as a merchant and as a serviceman. <coughs> so here's the, the term nokri. Um, so the, the question of Nokri and the, the term Nokar, and we've seen this um, yesterday also, is uh, notoriously pl uh, playable and encompassing. So Kreyasen, in the late 19th century, uh, takes it to mean a servant paid by cash, uh, in cash by the year. And there have, has been work by Street Dirk um, Dirk Cole from the medieval period, who has um, considered that this term mostly um, would have referred to a tradition of soldiering characteristic of this region. So people, you know, um, involved in pastoral activities part of the year in um, cultivation, but also hiring themselves out as soldiers um, to um, basically employ the different armies from um, the Mughal and even earlier period up to the early company state. Um, but what is interesting is also that uh, the, in, in this case, for instance, the, the merchant, which is also another figure of mobility, is not necessarily different or you know, opposed to the, um, the serviceman. So here I just um, one of the uh, one of the songs was that um, how did you spend your days in the north when you when you went for business? The husband replies, all day long I was in the service um, of the Raja, and all night long I lay on the bed with um, a Malini. So here we find the Malini again. Uh, so what is interesting to me here is that, and this is the argument Kof makes actually, that you don't have to see an opposition between um, commercial activities, pastoral activities, and um, this mercenary type of um, soldiering practices. Uh, what is important also to note, and I come back to that, is that the absent husband is himself integrated in a world people with mobile figures. So he's not the only person on the move. On the move. You have the boatmen, you have sometimes soldiers, Sipahi coming in, and most importantly, you have a person usually referred to as Batohi, which basically means a traveler, a wanderer. Someone who is on the move, we don't know why, we just know that um, he basically is mobile. Uh, but the main point that I want to look at now is uh, the way these representations have shifted in connection with changes uh, in pattern of circulation and um, labor practices. So you have many different things um, that can change. The introduction of new symbols to signify the distant land, the reconstitution of the spatial imagery, uh, imagery and new ways of characterizing and describing the activities of um, the husband. And just to go back quickly to the song that I just showed you, um, what, what is interesting there is what's in the phone, which is really important, because the call to um, go back to work comes from the phone. In, uh, in other texts, it would be the letter. So you really have, you, know, you can trace these kind of, um, of changes. So in just of um, spatial imagery, Calcutta becomes the new embodiment of um, the distant land. In previous song, it was more vaguely um, referred to as either the north or um, the east, which were the traditionally the two regions where people would go, especially um, for um, business purposes. What I find interesting in this shift from the east or even generally Bengal to Calcutta is that it actually also indicates a shift in the nature of circulation itself. So merchant activity and service in previous songs are presented as very seasonal, linked to a rhythm of agricultural life. One of the main type of songs that you have is called Baramasa, the so song of the 12th month. Um, and the, the idea is, you know, the husband is always supposed to come back at one precise time of the year. He does or doesn't, but in any case, it's supposed to be extremely seasonal type of migration. Um, so that, that would be a shift in this new song. And also, uh, if mobility is linked with the region, it also means that it is not linked with settling, but more with kind of you know, constant move um, for business purposes or as a, as a soldier. But when moving becomes associated with Calcutta, it's not only a physical place, but a city, it also becomes associated with something different, that is to say, with settling in a different place, the coming back and forth continues, but the relationship to, um, the, to the, the new place is, is quite different. But most importantly, the husband activity um, came to be represented in different ways, as the emphasis was put on the need to earn. Usually the word that comes in is kamana, to, to earn money, rather than the performance of an activity, whether service or mercantile um, sort. And here, so I want to look at Vikari Thakur's play, which I've mentioned. 
So Pivesia uh, was most likely composed and performed first in the 1920s, 1930s. The, basically, the, the play is that the Videshia meets his wife, Kari Sundri, in um, the village and he goes to Calcutta, where he soon settles with another woman. Kari Sundri, desperate, uh, meets Batohi, so our um, very helpful wanderer, whom she sends to um, basically bring her husband back to her, which he actually does. So he meets with uh, Videshia, tells him that his wife is very miserable, that he should go back, and Videshia dies. Um, come back. So it builds on very traditional themes, but also in many ways it signals a shift in representation of work and mobility. So in terms of symbolical repertoire, throughout the play the train station from which the husband left, but also from which he's hoped to return, the letter and the money that he sends to provide for his family uh, become extremely symbolically and emotionally child, um, child item. So just to quote you know, what Batoi says to Bidesha when he finally meets him, you came to Calcutta, so you should have sent a letter promptly, you should have sent some money by money order, this would have made great noise in the village. But also, uh, you have a um, reflection regarding the way the husband's mobility is depicted. The reason for going away is always throughout the play presented as twofold. One is um, earned, and the other one is, and what, that's what, you know, when Videshia wants to go please with his wife, Piari, let me go and see the world a bit. Um, so, you know, the need, the, the wish to explore new places. Um, the question of work and how you know, the, the shift in the representation of work can also be explored in some of the folk songs that were collected, especially by Patriarchs in the 30s, 40s. Um, and this, this is an extremely uh, interesting, but also extremely unusual um, song. So there is none like it in Pavia text. I don't think I've seen any song actually where money um, is quoted in this text, which is still extremely quite traditional. Um, so the song is very repetitive, so it goes such, his cha-cha, so the paternal uncle, sent the first letter, Babua, so you know, it's an enduring term for the, for the um, boy or the young man, don't give up your service, money is a great thing. His church sent the second letter, but why don't give up your service, money is a great thing, and so on, until the fifth letter. Um, who, so his wife sent the fifth letter, oh beloved, give up your service, so again, no cream, money is nothing. And so upon reading his wife's letter, the husband went against everyone's wishes and came home. Money is nothing. Um, what is interesting here um, and is striking is, so it is an expression of the wife's love for her husband, and it's extremely traditional in that sense. But uh, it also presents a picture of Nokri, which is extremely different from other texts. And as a Bidesia, is very openly associated with the fact of earning money. And the figure which appears here of a man driven away by material needs, as the family appoints him to go and earn in a distant location, is really different from more traditional dep depictions, where mobility is presented as the husband's choice and preserve. This takes us point to a different and bigger reality. The notion of material benefit was not absent from um, earlier texts, but there it appeared in the magnified shape of wealth and store of riches, of elephants and jewels, of diamonds and precious stones, which the husband would be um, the husband would be brought, would bring back from his travels. Um, in Bidesia, the experience of going away is really different because when he wants to go back, he fights with both his uh, landlord and shopkeeper over the money he owes them, and at the end, he has only his gamcha, so basically a piece of cloth, to uh, go back home with. So he comes um, empty-handed. Another text, again, uh, extremely uh, unusual in Padia's um, collection, is um, how you actually have work specified in a very unusual, uh, unusual way. So, I'll just read the text. When my husband heard the sound of the siren, um, siren he came running to my lab. He works uh, to camp, place on the grid's camp, in a jute wheel, chakal, a thin plate move on walls of brick, and around a leather rope. Um, a leather rope. What is interesting is that the fright of the husband hearing the sound is actually a very common trope. But usually, he, the, the husband gets afraid hearing um, his wife, the sound of his wife's anklet, which is you know, meant to signal in a very young husband and kind of um, situation um, in, uh, in, in, in that context, more romantic um, kind of situation. But in this context, it seems to refer to harsh living and working condition. And at any rate, what is um, interesting is that the usual trope is that the wife pleads with the husband, um, with the husband, so that he won't go. Here, the husband runs away to his wife and doesn't want to go. So, um, finally, to um, end on a very contemporary note, this is a, a song. So again, a very contemporary song that you can find on uh, on YouTube. Um, 
Again, very much more specific in terms of um, the place of work and the kind of work. Just to read briefly, I have heard that there is coal in Chalia. The water there is bad, everyone is dark. You two are dark, and if you go there, you will come back even darker. So the concern of the wife over the bad water is extremely common. But here, the association between coal mines, so we can assume that the husband might would be walking in a coal mine, and um, her husband becoming darker, all converge to a depiction of work, which is both much more specific, but also much more negative than in the formal text. Now I'll just move on to, um, yeah, to my long um, conclusion. But uh, in terms of analysis, so these sounds really offer an entry point to study the way circulation and work in a distinct place have been presented and how this has changed over the years. It allows to highlight progressive shifts and changes and inflections in the connotation of the concept. And I mostly focus here on um, Nokri, which so was um, more associated with Kamana, so earning, and with money, which comes as Nagel, cash, or Pesa, with harsher and unpleasant working conditions. Um, but what's interesting is that most of the texts um, really emphasize not work, but really what is common to the experience of men moving out. So the anguish of separation and the isolation of the woman left behind, the risk always present that links will be severed and that the husband will fail to come back. It doesn't mean that all work experience were perceived to be equivalent, and here it is interesting to bring in new um, other sources. And I emphasize here that I do it in a very rapid and very tentative kind of way. But if you take um, so uh, Premchand's Godan, uh, so Premchand, we actually, um, so, uh, Prabhat has referred to the Progressive Writers um, Movement, and so he was one of these um, associated with this movement, and he uh, generally so was a, a writer from um, UP who wrote extensively on village life, life and on social issues. And Godan is his most famous um, book, published in 36 for the first time. And you have one figure, um, Goba, who is the son of a poor agricultural laborer. He goes out, he goes to Lucknow, there he walks for a bit and then he comes back triumphantly to the village. When he comes back, one of the local, you know, um, big men of the village asks him, when did you arrive, Goba? You are doing well? Were you in service somewhere in Lucknow? So he says, Lucknow me? And Goba replied, I didn't go to Lucknow to be a slave, Gulami Karna. Uh, service, Nokari, is nothing but slavery, Gulami. I was doing business. So here, um, it comes back and it raises a lot of questions that we've touched on in terms of um, slavery and um, Nokri. But what I find interesting also is the opposition um, between Nokri and business, because as we've seen before, you have it before in, in previous songs, but there is not a certain opposition. It can, it can be different activities. Here, they are opposed because, uh, at least in, in this quote, there is the idea that um, Nokri is associated with rather demeaning service and a relation of dependency when business appears to be valorized for the independence it would you know, purport, um, it seems to grant. Uh, other sources and oral testimonies are full of such distinctions between permanent and temporary employment, between work that is seen as skilled or at least to necessitate some kind of learning, uh, and as unskilled work um, like must do. And I would just like to, and this will be my last um, point, to draw on a life history which I collected so, um, um, in Ghazipur in Eastern UP. So, um, Mundalal is an elderly man of about 70 years um, year old. He's a Chama by caste, and he was employed uh, from 66 to 80 in the Tikagawa paper mill, where he was working as um, a mastery, so um, a, a mason. He, uh, when he narrates his life trajectory, he always insists on his identity as a Rajmistri, uh, which he associates with a certain degree of skill because he will go on and on about how he was trained by someone that he calls his guru, and that he associates also with, um, with pride, uh, very clearly the, um, a sense of pride, but also security, that, that he was never hopeless, he was never destined looking for work, he was always in demand as a skilled worker. So even when there was no work in Titaga paper mill, he could always find you know, some house to be somewhere. And his, uh, the way he talks is full of distinctions between different types of work. So just to quote some of the um, some of the, the, the things he said. In the 80s there was a, a lockout and so he said that uh, when the mill closed all the master came back here. I also came back here. I am a rat mystery. And then I started doing my craft um, vanda over here. And again, Mazdur and mystery is something that he will oppose, um, continuously oppose. Another opposition he makes is between Nokri and um, Danda. So Danda can be defined as basically non-salaried non work, 
So then that he uses to refer to when he wasn't employed in the paper mill, but when he had to you know, move from one uh, basic construction site to the next, so building that house and building this house. Uh, I'll just quote what he says, but it, it's also rather interesting. If you have to do daily work, daily dantakarna, it's a constraint. No good is such that you become free, satan, um, or autonomous more. Um, you have to go and do your job, juti karnahe, and that's it. You don't have to look for it, so for, um, for work. If you have a job outside, uh, if you move outside, build this, um, this house here, um, then when it's over, where to go. So again, what is interesting here, it's completely the reverse. Freedom or autonomy comes from nokri because it gives you a certain degree of stability, and you don't, you know, you not, uh, you don't have to, to look for um, for work. <coughs> this is just a very tentative kind of uh, idea, but the, the point being that you have to look at the words that are used and how they are used, and um, you have, you can have very contradictory kind of um, pictures depending on what you look at, and I think this is a quite a, a an interesting way to, uh, to, to look at work in, uh, in general in these different sources. And, just so, and that will be my, uh, my conclusion. Um, the, the question that I wanted to, uh, the main question that you have when you look at these sources is really why this vagueness regarding work? Um, you know, is it linked to the genre itself, so to the fact that it is an older genre? So that we also you know, build on this kind of inherited trope, so the term Nokri has a long history. And when you find Nokri, when you find Nokri in a text of 2000 or of the 1930s, 40s, you know, which Nokri are we talking about? Because the reality of Nokri has changed, but at the same time the word you know, is also, I mean, comes also from a longer, uh, longer history, longer tradition. Um, this could also be linked to the fact that circulation is not valorized because of the employment it allow, uh, allows, but the attraction of the distant land actually comes from the place itself. So when it's Falcada, the fact that it's a city, um, we have also you know, a lot of things about the enchanting Bengali woman, uh, and also just generally the kind of objects that are associated with migration, including um, jewelry, um, all, all kind of um, new items. But um, but then the vagueness also allows to bring together experiences and practices which are extremely different and could also constitute a, um, the reason for the lasting popularity of these songs, uh, which is also raising the question of whether notwithstanding the very different occupation undertaken by migrant, there is something common to the experience of being basically a good fully migrant in Takata in, um, in Assam. And the last point uh, that um, one can look at is the question of uh, change and continuity through time. So what this song really show very well and some that historians have been looking at is the fact that mobility is not new, so urbanization and industrialization did not you know, suddenly put people on the move, people were on the move uh, from before, but then the question of change also comes in. So if people have been moving out to the Nokri, then again what is the, the link between say being a mercenary, uh, being a merchant, being so a Nokia in, in that order definition uh, working in the jute mill, working in the coal mine, and now you know, going to Saudi Arabia. You have the same words, you have the same kind of symbolic repertoire, um, with also new items being brought in, but the, the question of change and continuity then becomes um, extremely important. Thank you. diving into an ocean. Uh, there are lots of servants in lots of things. When we uh, started making a list, uh, Prabhat and I, also Vibhuti, both Prabhat, 
uh, the list became huge. It's for the simple reason that the social dominates uh, as a genre. Uh, as far as Hindi cinema is concerned, one can say this about Indian cinema in general as well. Uh, and social is also uh, a space which is more or less about family. Not only about family, but also about the family. Families are often large. Big families, also small families, but large families generally need uh, servants. And these films are as much about those servants as they are about the, the employers, uh, as these are about the, uh, the employers. So the two films that I'm going to discuss in detail, but let me list out some of the films so that you know you can come up uh, with uh, counter narratives, which is possible. Right? Uh, I make one kind of generalization about cinema, about work, about uh, servants. You can come up with another kind of generalization. It's entirely possible. So all, all, everything is possible. Anari, Parayatham, Sansevaru, Bhaiya, Sahibu, Jorulam. And you cannot think of Asit Sen, Eke Hangal, Saten Kapu, right? All these characters. Sita, Gita, Ram, Shyam, and of course Sholeh also. Uh, Bhavarchi is what I'm going to discuss a bit. Uh, which was also remade. Angur, Sharabi, Beat Gata Chal, all of this, Chacha Zindabad. Some of these films you might not have seen. Huh? Also, uh, Earth 1947. Exactly. So exactly. That beautiful one with Nandita. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, and then of course, yeah. yeah. Chacha. Uh, uh, kind of characters in a lot of what is called Muslim socials uh, that started in 1930s uh, itself. Of course, it's also an audacious domain. It's audacious in the sense that it's melodrama, we all know, melodrama has been written about as the medium, as the genre of the week, where the mute, uh, those who are incapacitated, those who can't speak, melodrama is the form which gives them voices. It was you know, identified with the blacks, for example, in the uh, Hollywood context. It has been written about by Ravi Vasudevan, Hira Bhaskar, others in the context of India, uh, uh, in Indian context. And so, uh, melodrama it is what it is. Those who are going to apply the optics of realism to understand cinema, Indian cinema, therefore, uh, will miss a lot of things, which is what I think uh, 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 Madhu and Ruth Vanita did when, did, uh, when they did a survey of uh, uh, women's servants, women labor, women's labor in Indian films. It was uh, published in Manushi, available. Uh, and they say that you know, uh, these servants have not really been treated well. There is no focus on their labor. Is, uh, they are shown as furniture in the house. They uh, lack of agency, and uh, so they are just there, uh, and they have not been treated as human beings. And they, you know, and as was the pattern in the film criticism by and large, you criticize popular cinema and you extol realistic cinema. So of course you go for some Sham Benegal films and say, look here. The servant comes alive. Asli right? I am. Uh, this is what I am going to argue against. Uh, like a lot of film scholars these days are doing, especially the scholars who can be called cinephiliac scholars. Right? They also love uh, popular cinema. Uh, in, 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 it's, it's obvious in their writings. So. Well, we were talking about. Uh, Names uh, and uh, so Ramu Kaka and Rahim Chacha, but also Mangal is a name that often comes. Uh, Hari is a name that often comes. Hariya, right? And uh, is not very far from Hari. But there is one clip in uh, Mokri which I am not going to show in Bimal Roy film, in which uh, Kishore Kumar struggles throughout. Uh, 
the, the film to get a job and he is frustrated, utterly frustrated and he lives in a lodge which is owned by a kind of compassionate uh, guy and it's basically managed by uh, Kanayala who is the knocker. So when Kanayala is being called by uh, uh, the owner Hurry, hurry, hurry! I am calling you. I have been calling, uh, I've been, uh, calling you for how many times? So he comes, Kanayala, uh, a bit irritated, but also in control and tells him, So what happened? What's the problem? You know, you called uh, God. So there was a logic in this name giving. Of course, there are Buddha, Mangara, and all those, you know, how uh, the days on which a particular servant was born, all of that is there. But there is also this logic that you name the servant's name is God's name, so that you can work it every time you, you know, uh, call that servant. I will now um, discuss a film which was made by V. Shankaram. Uh, one from, you know, I will discuss Bhavachi and I will discuss uh, uh, Teen Chavasta. One from the 1950s, Teen Chavasta. One about a maid, Teen Chavasta, made in a large family. V. Shankaram, it's a film uh, actually about Nehruvian modernity, Nehruvian fantasy of uniting a diverse India. And that, that diverse India actually, you know, is there in that household which is uh, in crisis because the servant has uh, eloped, <laughs> right, disappeared. So they are looking for a servant, but it's a difficult household in the sense that the patriarch is uh, Punjabi, his wife Mechia, she is uh, Banarsi yeah? and all these all the other women are from different parts of India. So there is one, they are also named after railways. So Madras, Tamil, Calcutta, and, and we, we are introduced to them as they receive calls from their respective you know, families. So different linguistic zones they come from. They have also uh, different culinary tastes. So to manage a, such a diverse household is not uh, a joke. So uh, there is one Akbar Wali, one of those papers, she comes and she, you know, a lot of people encounter her, interrogate her, interview her and she answers in everybody's language. Right? She is multilingual, she's great, the ideal, the fantasized servant that you can have, the ideal so, she answers in their language, so, and she is also good. There is a power in the house, but she is good at managing. Yeah? And one lacking comment is that, okay, if the uh, food uh, can God, we don't have different waters in different areas, otherwise every person will ask different kind of uh, food, uh, water also every morning or uh, whenever. So what happens is that, ultimately, uh, she is dark, we don't know anything about her caste, but her status is very well known, her class is very well known in the sense that she is poor, is supported uh, by her father, she lives with her she supports her father, she also sings for radio station. And uh, so it, it, it is also a film, it also about communication. It's a period when Hindi Wallace, about which we talked a bit yesterday, the dream of nationalism, Hindi nationalism, uh, has come to a stage where it can be actually implemented. All those, uh, you know, uh, ideas that the reformers, Hindi writers, had practiced only in writing because they now control a bit of power. So, what are you doing now? You are writing new dictionaries. That is happening. Eh? Dr. Raghuveer was writing new dictionaries then. Uh, a lot of them very Sanskritized. That debate is indexed here. But it is done through the maid, through Sandhya. Ultimately, the, the hero protagonist, who is a lexicographer, he is doing that. He is making a desh kosh, a lexicon for the country, which can cover 
something like 16 languages. Okay, hefty let's uh, uh, So uh, let's watch this clip. <coughs> Sorry, there are no subtitles, I'll explain. I am going to make a lexicon. You know? I am going to this is a page of the So she's been hired and she's, you know, uh, working, of course, feeding him, giving uh, 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 and then she looks at this paper where this one word that even uh, she she can't pronounce, right? Vashprat Vishramstha Matha Dukya Hevatman You know, it brings the uh, headache to your headache uh, Speaking it out So, uh, she, uh, because uh, uh, Karantivan is in the habit of speaking in synonyms He is so much immersed in his work of lexicography uh, There is uh, always, whenever he encounters something, he you know, spews out uh, synonyms uh, so she asks him and he sees an opportunity uh, to make a different kind of lexicon other than what was being made by the state at that uh, time which would be commonsensical, which would include commonsensical word. Uh, there is a long struggle of you know, from starting with Fallon and others from 19th century uh, to uh, uh, long struggle to make lexicons that can be, can speak to the people, can actually uh, be made from words collected from uh, uh, women, from rural areas, from other dialects, etc., etc., and not just one source, right? So uh, it 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 it, uh, it is placed there. So this, what she does is she brings a kind of common sense. Ultimately, there is a fight. The uh, uh, great thing about Shantaram's heroines and heroes as well is that these are uh, uh, people who work with hands, right? They do a lot of manual labor, but they are all dignified people. Uh, so you can't insert them. She gets inserted, Sandhya, at one point of time by one of the bahus, one of the mistresses, and then she uh, goes away. Of course, Hero falls in love with her and that creates a, a huge crisis in the household. But ultimately, they find that you know, they cannot do without her. They are so dependent on her. So, oh, the entire household chases her in a car while she is running away in a train to get her back. And that's how it's a happy ending. The lexicon also. Uh, you know, comes back, if it's public, it gets published, the copy comes, that's where the thing ends. Now, how much time do we have? Yes. Very well, 
and he can talk very well, right? He has a, a line for every occasion, and he's also a kind of shrink in the household, right? He uh, people who are not talking to each other, he makes them talk to each other, and he also sometimes lies uh, to uh, achieve that. Uh, uh, so he puts the whole house in order, and uh, he. Uh, uh, so who's he ultimately, right? That's the question that uh, he's been uh, dressed in a particular fashion, right? Uh, he's wearing uh, uh, what what kind of boy scout kind of yeah, dress, and he is traveling with a bag. Uh, his own bag, and uh, he is an itinerant servant, right? A kind of angel uh, that you find in uh, you know Shakespeare and other places, who whose job it is to put such houses in order, uh, which he does. Ultimately, he also puts himself uh, in line, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, for charges of theft, which is usually associated with uh, servants, right? And servants also in a lot of films rationalize it by saying iska dhan jata hai, uska dharam bhi jata hai. Right? So that's the common sense here. Otherwise, you know, kisi ne, uh, uh, so you lose your sense of uh, morality, moral compass, if you lose your uh, money, if you are, uh, it gets stolen. So this one puts that uh, in line because he wants Jaya Bhagavari to get married to the person she loves and it also is pushing uh, uh, the, the, the moral boundaries by creating certain scandals uh, in the household or explaining uh, uh, to the, uh, the patriarchs and others, uh, the matriarchs that it is, it is not such a scandal after all to love somebody etc uh, etc. Et and then he uh, Walks out. Obviously, we uh, 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 he reveals about himself towards the end. He tells everybody who's he actually. So we learn that he is uh, was a professor. He was teaching somewhere in Banaras, <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, he didn't enjoy it so much. So he changed a few jobs, but now this is his job. This is what he tries to do to show dysfunctional household, middle classes, uh, you know, uh, how it is dignified to do manual labor and uh, a lot of common sense in terms of uh, making and uh, uh, maintaining relationships, a bit of sensitivity uh, and uh, a bit of wisdom. So uh, where is this character then? Why do we get such characters? I said it is fantasy, but there are cultural uh, uh, precedents. In uh, Vidyapati's Ugna, uh, the, in this fantasy about this jinn, right, who can appear and do everything that you ask it to, right? You just have to rub the bloody lamp. So it's there, it has been there. And cinema, I think, develops on that theme. And uh, it is not so much about servants as it is about those who are employing these servants in the films that we have discussed. Of course, it's possible to bring out other narratives where servants are the focus, their lives are the focus. But here it's somewhat different. Thank you. So uh, we are running 20 minutes late. So I think we have almost. Uh, 15 to 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, so I see these uh, sessions, uh, particularly this session, as a, as a cultural one. And I think uh, most of the time, what we do with our uh, material is that either we enter into a highly ideological reading of the stuff, or or to have a culturalist spin on it. And I think both the presentations are, uh, in some senses, are a warning to that, that uh, while we are looking into hard social economic uh, realities of service, servitude, servitude, 
there is a cultural register on which these things to be teased out. So I just open it up uh, for discussion. Uh, we'll have uh, three or four or five in one set, and then they will respond. So the, the, the new practices of mobility which you are trying to describe is related to the new conditions of immobility along the lines of gender. So men are more mobile but women are also. So, so I feel that you uh, once you do employ this category of circulation which helped us uh, more than a decade ago when this concept was introduced to us and I am borrowing from Nilatri's article in, the, in that volume, it helped us to capture the predicaments of mobility and that was useful. But now pushing it too far is like only looking for the things which are anyway obvious. So, uh, so can we imagine writing the history of those women who did not travel but they were caught up in the web of mobility. They desired their saris to come from Calcutta, they desired their bindis to come from Calcutta. Uh, what were they doing? Were they farmed? Uh, they were they working in fields? Did they uh, start working as maids when their men were away? So, to try, I would push you to bring the picture of the of the women uh, into this whole circulation. Maybe so the framework of circulation needs serious revision. So, mine is uh, I think an observation. Uh, the popular songs you are looking at uh, of various varieties, there is one more popular thing, the popular uh, devotional popular and then the Brat Kathas, say the Santosima Brat Katha for example has the same kind of thing that the husband is uh, has gone to the town and again he is there with another woman and then the Mata intervenes and brings the husband back who is doing Nokri in town and it has a bit of different reflection in Jaisan Pusima, the film. <coughs> Very brief comment for comment and question for the The brief comment is because it has nothing to do with the paper. I just noticed that the Jhariya song is put together by the Dalit Resource Center. And I was interested in how the songs that are not marked by caste get reappropriated as they are now being archived. So I was just interested if, if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, uh, Rebecca, so uh, the question to you is this. The sense that I got is that the, between the two tropes of the servant as the one who can cause possible scandals, possible uh, servant as risk of various kinds, and the servant as no good. So if one were to state these two tropes, so what you get here is the servant as the practical person. And in that practicality, is this a critique of a middle class that is alienated from this world? Is that what has happened? So that the servant brings them down to earth in terms of how to do ordinary things. Um, to, to rephrase that question, Tamil, that's a, you see, and I think it should be answered. It is not that the women are immobilized. Actually, what we have is this interesting pattern. Women, in short term mobility, they are the maximum, maximum mobile. So that we have this uh, crazy figure that women are the largest proportion of migrants in India because they, they always are very local. They go and marry somewhere. So it is always called marriage migration. But as we see, it's actually a labor migration of a sort. But it's never been looked at like that. It's been seen as and alongside, so it's not women's immobility. Of course, they are immobilized in their. Uh, uh, it appears in songs. Yeah, but it, it does appear in songs also. That's why I'm saying this one specific song. The other saying is longing for your uh, natal uh, home, and this you should bring together in order to show the difference. I don't think I don't think she is uh, wrong in saying that this is about circulation of a particular kind. 
I, I don't think she's wrong there. I think I'm a bit, yeah. All I would say that add it with the other and to show this particular pattern. So with us work and show this as uh, much earlier about the that men are mobile and women are left behind at home. And that pattern is a central pattern and the household is not the household, it's a stretched household. When you look at who is maximizing what, you have to connect these two households, look at work and so I think just to add a dimension to it, which is, is, not, is to look at the longing of the woman for her natal home, which is also there in the songs. Baramasiya mein bhot hai. So to bring these two together would we'll tell you this two pattern which happened, that women are most, my, most Indian migrationist characters are very high uh, movement of women, uh, but it's short distance, relatively short distance and very long distance migration of men. There is a question. Thank you. I also have a comment for Camille. Uh, I really enjoyed your paper. It's a kind of methodological comment about using songs as a source. Because it seems to me that I mean, you, you introduced them very um, clearly at the beginning as a literary source and you did this nice work of thinking about continuity. But of course, uh, they're also a performance as your wonderful clip at the beginning showed and they are an oral source. So how can we recover the context in which these things were performed and the kind of performance styles that went with them, which we know from all the work on 19th century popular culture, um, uh, you know, changes the, uh, the meaning significantly, the gesture, the, uh, the punchline, which is quite hard to recover from just reading them as, as, as textual sources. So what do you have on that? And, and does that give us any other readings of this source? No, I'll be very brief. Uh, actually, one thing. Um, Lucy, in fact, anticipated a little bit, but I'm going to push that a little further. It, it is in. Um, I'm just wondering whether you would like to consider the intentions behind both the sort of connection of these folk songs and Martens. And what does that collection, the, the very choice of certain songs being collected and put forward, what does that tell us? Because if I were to look at other kinds of compilations put forward or put together in other states where you could have a very troubled relationship with the city and the notion of migration and with its desires and a very troubled relationship with the country which you sort of invoke very rhetorically, what would that then do to this story? So I'm really curious about the intention behind all these collections and then how you would want to read the afterlife or the multiple lives of one kind of song from Grierson to the YouTube. So that's one. Uh, Ravika, I really enjoyed it. I missed Raheem. I mean, I really enjoyed it. And I think that would be useful because in a sense, Raheem Chandra is also inclusive of that Peruvian modernity, however flawed it might be. My question is, you know, you did say, you gave a very interesting throwaway that uh, how does one explain this fantasy and in that cultural specificity can we look at the idea of the jail? Here I would actually also try and figure out what the immediate pre scenario performance traditions are and what kind of magic realism they actually play with. And how does that uh, feed into some of the contradictions of modernity? That the state is actually perfect. If I can just add a few things to what Prabhu um, said about circulation. Um, see, the, the, when women, uh, the, the, there is a very strong Vidai tradition, uh, which is when the bride departs from her natal home to go to her uh, marital home. There is it. There are a lot of lot of songs about that itself, and it seems to imply that this is a that one is going away never to return. Um, and there is a, a the, there is a suggestion in many of um, um, the folk sort of tradition that there is a women are mobilized at marriage to, for marriage migration to then be immobilized as a wife. But in fact, that never happens. I mean, anybody who knows anything about Indian tradition, women come back for their first childbirth, which is why the rice eating ceremony is by the mama. 
um, and that every major annual festival, festival women come back. So there is in fact the circulation of women which often takes the form of a circulation between natal and marital uh, home. So the, this contrast between the mobility of men and the mobility of women is a constructed one. Um, and the, the, what would be interesting is to find out why. Uh, why you are getting this extremely gendered contrast in, in terms of mobility. Uh, the second um, issue would be that uh, in terms of Veda Hara, this husband going away and the wife's longing uh, is a trope in various kinds of, so in Vaishnava uh, literature, in, in, a, in, in a lot of Indian literary genres, this is a common. So one wonders how far it is a, a trope and how far it is a reflection of, you know. Um, and the third thing about what Nitin said about what songs may reflect, a lot of the Grierson songs in fact speak about sexual violence uh, in the absence of the husband. And I've often wondered why, um, you know, why such a trope uh, which is mostly about love and longing, should also have um, this trope, and I've never been able to reconcile this. Yeah, um, like, uh, like everyone else, uh, I must uh, thank both of you for this wonderfully entertaining presentation. Uh, uh, first to Ravi Kant, you know, I was slightly um, sort of, I, I was wondering, uh, if, if, you know, the larger structure of your, and the choice of the two films, uh, because uh, in both the films there is also, uh, there appears to me some sort of uh, continuity. Uh, both appear to come from, uh, you know, if, if uh, I, I won't be surprised if, uh, someone was to work on uh, whether uh, Rishikesh Mukherjee is also taking something from the Shantara. Uh, the reason why I say this is because what unites them is this uh, obsession with nation building. And it is uh, probably a more middle class nation building fantasy, the magic realism that Rashmi is talking about, which appears to be projected onto the character here in one case of uh, uh, governess come servant like figure in the other case of uh, Babaji, uh, where the question of these two characters being servant almost becomes incidental. Uh, you know, they are not really, uh, I mean, they're not really the servant that that you can recognize. Uh, the the uh, you know the, the uh, second comment or question uh, is for Kamil. Again, extremely rich paper. Uh, so many questions there, you know, a couple of very minor things you said, Bojpuri is a dialect of Hindi, uh, that, that really hurts. Bojpuri comes from old Hindi, uh, uh, but I'm sure you know that, so it was a minor. Uh, uh, but the larger question is, it would be great if you could also probably have done uh, uh, this was not the time that uh, you could also pay um, uh, attention to the nuances of language, not just in the sense of meaning, which I'm sure we're already doing, but also in terms of the coming together of very multiple kind of uh, lexical uh, uh, flows. For example, Vidai, you know, it's coming from Vidat, uh, it's, it's uh, coming from a Persian uh, origin, uh, and a whole lot of other words uh, which also put a very different kind of uh, uh, spin on, on uh, your interpretation. For example, Videsya itself, today we use the word Vides for a foreigner. And here Vides, Pardes and whole uh, you know, uh, spectrum of words that is referring to the other place uh, also mark out for us different kinds of ways in which we can identify this place and the fact that there is no foreign as against uh, outside the nation uh, marker in pre-modern times. Uh, I also thought that, uh, uh, you know, this whole idea of uh, uh, looking for uh, 
you know, to, to, trying to go beyond the template once you have identified the template, trying to go beyond to look for the specificity of the narrative that you, the song that you're looking at, uh, will help. It would help if you were to look at the history of it beyond a little beyond golf. Golf uh, has also essentialized the figure of soldiers. Uh, there are earlier texts, uh, 14th century, uh, 15th century texts in vernacular languages, especially in Upper French, which mark out these areas. One such text uh, I can think of is Sandesh Rashad uh, by Abdul Rahman, which is uh, also in the uh, in, in, in a very, very similar kind of fashion. So uh, we have to really wrap up this session. You know, uh, so one line <laughs> thank you. question because you know it really has to I'll do it. I'll be very fast. Yes. Oh, uh, I'll be really fast. So um, just, I love your people, I just think it's very interesting to use the concept of, of essential servant, if you want to, because you know it's like even our own households depend on one, you know. The middle class household, like Raka Ray has said, depends on, you know, the way the people are running after, you know, as they will know, the whole crisis in this labor, you know, of that one essential servant, you know. And then I just find it very interesting how the, um, the you know, the, the, the person decides to leave the dis dysfunctional household to show that even traditional long term servants do leave and do make that decision to leave. I think the agency is. An interesting way to look at that. I think we can just take one question and it should be a really short question. Yeah. Sh short question. Um, short question, but perhaps one which can linger for longer. <laughs> um, it's both of you, very interesting papers, one looking at Nocker, mm -hmm. the other looking at Nocker just to begin with. And, uh, and I find that very interesting also because. Uh, coming from a period very distant from yours, I can find all kinds of resonances in my material and the things that you're talking about, which of course then gets me some suddenly very reminiscent about how history functions. So that's what we've been talking about, how we have a terminology which continues over a long period of time. And I think, you know, both of you are listening to just that complexity, even though relatively in a synchronic way. You know, I'm, just, I'm just sort of programming that the moment you move uh, your explanations, from the synchronic to the diachronic, you're running into problems because you're suddenly not doing the same history anymore. So this is going back to the point that Pankaj was making. One way to get into that would be just to pay far closer attention to language and to genre, because both of them are different. For example, Paramas is to be found in a particular time period, and it will be voicing sentiments which were perhaps still afloat, but not ever textualized. And now you're looking at textualization or naturalization in a completely different media. So just move, the moment you move to the diachronic mode, uh, you are faced with issues which are actually very, very interesting uh, with terms which have general modulation. Yeah. So uh, we'll have just um, uh, how much time to have five minutes. We, we don't have time, but yeah, still, but, yeah, yes, but, but still, it's, it's about folk culture, popular culture, and all those things. So, nine minutes to each. <laughs> and, and, yeah, two, two to three minutes each. And I have just one line question is that as someone can get hurt by calling Bhojpuri as, uh, as a dialect of Hindi, uh, a much deeper historical question is one should deeply think about Bhojpuri being a popular language. So the, the category of popular, the whole session is about popular, across popular cultures. And that is something which should have come up, come, come up in discussion. But three minutes, nine minutes? Yeah, so I'll start with apologizing about the um, dialect uh, thing. <laughs> it was a secret of tongue and um, even you know, the fact that Bosch should be a dialect or a language, I mean, it's complicated and I'm not going to go into that, but yes, it's something I would be very, yeah, very careful about. Um, and basically, the, the different questions that came up, the one on the songs um, that Lucia asked and um, Lakshmi as well, yeah, I, I didn't, I wouldn't have had time, that would have taken a whole hour uh, to go into precisely you know, what are these songs, how are they collected. It does raise um, a whole range of questions. Um, you know, if it's, you have a Brahmin scholar walking around in villages wanting to find what is a real village culture, of course he will you know, pick this or that. Um, song, uh, which is why it's also to me was very interesting that even him did 
put at least these two songs about Jude Mills and about money. Um, but they are exceptional in his collection. And then, but this is more what I'm trying to do now is to look at different um, sources. And so, apart from this very academic um, kind of collection that you have, you also have the chat books. And I think they're fantastic mm -hmm. sources actually, which I haven't had time to look into uh, enough. But the question of especially chat books that were published in Calcutta in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on, which some of them can be found. So, you know, what would they tell us? Is, are there any different songs? How are they collected? Uh, and so on. And again, with the people publishing the chat books were again higher caste um, people publishing from commercial um, um, aim. So, yeah, here the, the question of who collects why, uh, with which uh, aim is extremely important, and I, I would have to address it. Performance. Um, the clips are, for that reason, uh, very interesting, and I would also look into them um, quite extensively. Uh, a lot of it is lost. There are some traits we can have, especially for this itinerant uh, actor, so Bihari Takuz, before they were working with him, was still a bit there. Then you have the movie industry coming up, which is also interesting. Um, but yeah, a lot of things, I think, were rigidified by this folklorist type of trope of, you know, what is traditional song and who was singing what, uh, and making them very nicely into, uh, into this collection. And a lot of things get, um, get lost, but that, that really just have to be um, dealt with. The, the question, um, yeah, the, uh, so the question, uh, the, yeah, that it was so central, actually they, they have a project on Videshia um, generally. So interestingly, they have a whole project of collecting material on the Videshia tradition. So you would have, like, Bahaya's, um, sorry, um, Gara, um, Bahaya Arab Garele, um, different things like that. But it's also interesting because cast and these songs, so some songs are supposed to be associated with specific cast. Um, so yeah, the question of, again, you know, whom, who's uh, this song, who is um, singing, who's performing for whom, who's identifying is extremely complicated and cast would have to be factored in as with religion because these songs seem to be extremely Hindu when you know, obviously you have Muslim bourgeois speakers, Muslim migrants, Muslim Bidesia, so what, how do you bring them together? Uh, about so communication, uh, sorry, uh, <coughs> circulation um, and so on. So f for the purpose of the paper, I tried to focus on the Nokri, um, which maybe didn't actually come up enough, but that was really the question I wanted to address. So question of synchronicity, um, evolution through time, how you trace it, and so on. Uh, and of course, yeah, the women were extremely absent, and um, which, um, given the song, uh, is, uh, is important that this, they are great material to look at, at women and it's really the question of women mobility would be a, a huge question and the relationship with the marginal home is also an important question and, and also you know, how, how does the absence of a husband can also actually also have an impact on the woman both in terms of you know, how she lives in the village so her relation with the domestic space or the outside world but also with her natural natural home where you know, she can sometimes also find actually go back home more or um, find help there so yeah so yeah just uh, and also but the, the question is, is also about you know, woman mobility because maybe women didn't massively move um, as men did to take Calcutta for work but at least from the f very early on and from the 40s, 50s, they also settled there. Um, so what about the song? Do the song talk about the woman experience of being in Calcutta? If you think of the Chatka, you know, when he runs away to his wife, why is she? Is she in the village? Is she in the city? Yeah. So that's the whole range of questions that I, um, yeah, I would uh, like to look at. And the rest, um, yeah, and thank you for the, um, yeah, all the uh, advice on all the things to look at. Language and so on, um, yeah, I will look into it. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for your comments and uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, between servant as risk and servant as uh, a noble soul, uh, uh, I think there's a whole range of, uh, if you look at the larger picture. Uh, uh, and it is consistent with uh, a kind of uh, uh, picturization of marginal characters in uh, cinema by and large. Characters that often two forms uh, speak a higher truth, a truth uh, which is not available to the characters as they are mired in the immediate world. Okay, so a sense of higher truth it could be sung by an itinerant you know, uh, singer, but they are providing service to the society in one way or the other, and also could be could be bhaja. So these were also item numbers, pedagogic numbers. So, uh, a whole a lot of drama gets played out through the 
witnessing by the servant of the goings on in the households that can have servants, have had servants, right? It's a life cycle, right? That uh, this Rahim Chacha would, for example, would see. So, uh, in what, for example, you know, rise and fall of the family fortunes, when uh, you know, uh, they are, have to become servants, for example, and they detest it, right? The, uh, the family detests it, and ultimately it's a happy ending. Also, tradition, modernity, who, uh, they are witness to that. They also ally with certain people, but they also learn in due process. Uh, but they can also be shown as Kantavai, right? In film Dostan, who's scandalized by these two men coming together. So, uh, she, she is the Yaki. Yeah. Kalho now, thanks. So, uh, so uh, as a custodian of traditional morality, so to speak, huh? Those, so a whole lot of uh, uh, ways in which, uh, you know, uh, but they are very essential to the melodramatic narrative. They could be mute most of the time, but they would explode when the time comes. So that's the, you know, uh, so I would say, yes, here, it's, it's very practical and commonsensical, but uh, I would say, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of uh, trope uh, uh, that has been used in a larger context by other people as well. Uh, yes, I think uh, Anjali Gera Roy has recently listed a whole lot of you know, things from its cinema. Uh, there's a long tradition of Kathy Hansen, studying with Kathy Hansen, Rosie Thomas and others. What are these things that cinema is drawing on, right? including Parsi theatre and uh, uh, Baramasa tradition, which is being you know, from print to uh, Francisco Rossini's work, well. yeah. all these things are available there. The difference uh, would be, and it is, uh, it's an important point, uh, Sunil and Pankaj, that we are, uh, what is happening with the compression, for example, in Videsia of the Baramasa, right? Baramasa is about 12 months, right? Vyog over Vira over 12 months. But in the Sia song, uh, uh, the Baramasa that you see, I don't know if they come in for it or not, it's been compressed into three seasons only. Right? Once again, one can of course take it back to Kalidas. Is there? Like Sumiram can be taken to, you know, uh, the oldest Namavalis that you have, of course. Right? Smart. And of course, there's a lot of changes, things get added. To, uh, to the tradition, things also get deleted. Uh, but we can't you know, uh, say that there is no uh, continuity. There, there are things happening and people, there is a, this oral culture which is being transformed through you know, uh, artifacts of uh, production, new technological artifacts. Uh, and a lot is changing there. But a lot is also uh, uh, being retained, I would say. Amazing uh, continuity between tropes if we you know, look at across Sanskrit literature. Shabri, well, sorry, I have to, I'm tempted to give this example. Look at the Shabri, Lokendorf has written one article. Shabri in Ramayana is various forms of Ramayana, right? She is never shown feeding that Jutha bear, right? Half eaten bear to Ram. If you come down to Ramanand Sagar, Materiality of the film frame has to show these characters doing it. Jutha Ved can't remain a metaphor there. Here. So, you have Ram and Lakshman reacting differently to the Jutha Ved. Ram is eating it with uh, you know, uh, uh, relish while uh, Lakshman is move around. Okay. So, uh, so, 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 of course, there are interesting differences and we must uh, uh, be aware of that. Uh, I would agree, uh, 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 servants are not so incidental is what I am trying to say. They are, uh, they are doing everyday jobs. And by doing everyday jobs, they are teaching these dysfunctional people that these jobs need to be done. And if Bhavanshi leaves, 
He leaves also because he believes that love is causes or it, it has learned its lessons. The apprenticeship is over. That like poor box. Uh, uh, and and, and what, there's one scene in which Rajesh Karma actually that there's a slippery ground in the house. So and the camera you know, focuses on the first thing immediately he does is he cleans it. Nobody, you know, it did not strike anybody in the household. So these are little little things that so they are service. Even uh, uh, this radio singer and Akbar Thrower, Sandhya girl, right? Uh, the hero does not know that she is the singer, famous singer, and he is already love uh, in love with her voice. But here, uh, but, but it is you know with her that crisis then comes later. She 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 is obviously in a dilemma when to reveal her real identity, and she is. Uh, you know, suffers from this inferiority complex because she is dark complexion. So, she, and this painting that I show is uh, a product of his imagination of the voice that he had heard, he has heard on radio. Uh, so, no, I will think they are not incidental. Uh, they are very much uh, uh, servants. Uh, I am, yeah, essential servants. Thank you, Charmi. I'll keep all that. Okay. So, thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>